For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is John Mack. I am the artist behind this exhibition and forum, which is going on for the month of September here in New York. Thank you. I've got one more week to go. It's the final stretch. And I'm looking forward to October 1st. Um, so I am also the founder of a nonprofit that I began this year called Life Calling, which works to preserve our humanity in the digital age. And A Species Between Worlds is just one of the many initiatives that I have coming out. Actually, two of the other initiatives are two books that I've published this year, which um, you all will get upon leaving the building tonight. So I hope you enjoy them. And if they're heavy, just remember they're free, so it's worth it. <laughs> um, so. Tonight, uh, Life Calling is hosting Fair Play in this space, and I would like to first thank the host committee who helped put this together. Michelle Brown Blumberg, Paige Bowler, Heidi Gore, Gina Malin, Caitlin Malin, Ellie Manko Libby, Leanne Pei, Charlotte Pilaro, Susana Rosado, Nancy Ross, and Benny Tabatabai. Thank you very much. Now, a little bit about Fair Play. So, I joined the board of Fair Play eight years ago. And what we strive to do back then and still is to prevent companies from marketing to children. Now, that seems very sort of pie in the sky, but I will let you know that they did realize this in Brazil, so it is possible. And we're still on that mission. But what I want to say is, eight years ago, we were dealing with television commercials, advertising on food products, the next doll from Mattel, and we were standing up against those monsters. Now, these were egregious monsters, and what does that mean? It means that these toys, these commercials, this marketing was asphyxiating creative play. And any time creativity is asphyxiated, indoctrination has entered the equation. Fast forward eight years to today, we have a completely different monster on our hands with many tentacles. And as strange as this might sound, I'm actually very, very grateful that we have this monster, and I'll tell you why. Eight years ago, when we were telling parents and adults, we need your help, and they would ask why, and we would say, because marketing is detrimental to child health and well-being. They would say, what's the big deal about commercials? I don't get it. Fast forward eight years to today. Adults and parents all own devices and they are experiencing firsthand for themselves all the things we've been trying to fight for for children. And so now we have a huge movement behind us because there's an awareness and an understanding for, well, what our children are up against. And it's a big monster and they are depending on us. No matter how much you nag, no matter how much they hate you for it, deep down, unbeknownst to them, they are begging for it. So let's not give up on the children. Just a few points about Fair Play. <clears throat> this is a tiny organization with thin funds and budget, and they have made changes against Disney, Meta, and Google. And beyond all that, we do not accept corporate gifts because we don't want to conflict with our promises to kids. And that, my friends, I call integrity. And speaking of integrity, I would like to introduce a dear friend of mine, Josh Golan. Sorry, Josh, I'm going to use the paper here. Josh Golan has been at Fair Play for almost 20 years, 
the last seven as executive director. Under Josh's leadership, Fair Play has become the leading independent watchdog of the children's media and marketing industries and a powerful voice for children in Washington. And now I'll introduce Jean, who I've gotten to know over the years. Jean Rogers directs Fair Play's Screen Time Action Network, a global coalition of practitioners, educators, advocates, and parents working to reduce children's excessive screen time use and to keep kids safe online. Jean is a passionate advocate for children's rights in a digital world with a focus on strong collaborations with the brightest minds and leaders in digital wellness. And now to Francis Haugen. So happy to have you here, thank you. I mean, yeah, this is, this is a wonderful night. A wonderful night. Francis is a specialist in algorithmic product management, having worked on ranking algorithms at Google, Pinterest, Yelp, and Facebook. During her time at Facebook, Francis became increasingly alarmed by the choices the company makes prioritizing their own profit, profits over public safety and putting people's lives at risk. As a last resort and at a great personal risk, Francis made the courageous decision to blow the whistle on Facebook. The initial reporting was done by the Wall Street Journal in what became known as the Facebook Files. Haugen's revelations demonstrated, among other things, the company's top executives buried internal research that showed Instagram was harmful to teens' mental health. Ms. Haugen's courage led to a series of explosive hearings in Congress and changed the conversation about young people and social media. And before we clap, I want to say something. Before you tonight are leaders, and they are working for the good of this community, and we owe them everything for what they've done. So please join me. Thank you so much, John, for that eloquent introduction. Francis, we are happy to have you with us this evening. You were there, so you experienced firsthand the harms happening to children and teens. And what gave you the courage to disclose Meta's documents? And why did you do it? And what were some of the most concerning things that you saw? So I did not work directly on, uh, on well-being and children. Um, I worked within civic integrity, which was the part of Facebook responsible for making sure that Facebook was a constructive force in society, both with elections and just social stability more generally. When I joined Facebook in 2019, I thought I was joining to help prepare the United States for the 2020 election. When I showed up, I realized the job was not exactly what it had been represented to be. They had left off one key detail, which was I wasn't going to work on the election in 2020 in the United States. I was going to work on misinformation and the civic safety internationally. And what I was shocked to find was that I thought I understood what Facebook was. You know, I'd been a Facebook user since, I don't know, 2005 or something, 2006. The Facebook we use in the United States is safer and cleaner and more sanitized than any version of Facebook anywhere else in the world. They know that if they invest in safety here, we won't push them to be a more responsible agent in general. They'll make us think we know what social media is while they do much, much worse harm internationally. One, I'll give you an example. I spoke at a conference in Norway. My family is, is, is partially Norwegian-American. And uh, a journalist came up to me and they said, uh, we brought literally a thousand Instagram posts that were promoting suicide to Facebook. To, to, they said, we, we literally showed them to the public policy person and they said, oh, we can't do anything about that until you report them. 
So they came back and they reported all of them. They went through the effort of going through all those posts and reporting them, and none of them got taken down. So the thing that I learned while I worked on misinformation at Facebook was that Facebook doesn't scale linguistically. That Facebook has told us we can do whatever we want, we can design our products however we want because we're gonna make these magical AIs that will keep us safe. Only they didn't tell us they didn't bother translating those AIs language by language. And in the case of Norway, there just weren't enough Norwegians to matter about protecting kids against suicide. And so the reason I came forward was I saw that Facebook was misrepresenting what our options were. That if I had talked to any of you a year ago and said, hey, what do we do about social media? Most of you probably would have said, you know, it's really hard. I don't, I don't really know what to do. Like, there's all these problems, but I really value freedom of speech. And Facebook had spent hundreds of millions of dollars promoting this idea that the only path forward was either freedom of speech or safety. You had to choose. And the reality, particularly around kids' issues, is that there are lots and lots of options that don't actually focus on content. They focus on design. And there's ways of designing these products to be safe in every language. So it doesn't matter if you're a Norwegian, there's only five million Norwegian speakers, or if you speak English. There are ways to make these products safer that work in every language, but we have to force the companies to do them. That's just incredulous that the misinformation is working that way. It's just unbelievable. Josh, you've been an advocate in this area for 20 years. How is Francis Revelations impacting our work at Fair Play? Um, I don't think I could overstate what the um, disclosures by Francis last year have meant to the work of protecting children online. Um, I think the first thing I would say is it's changed the conversation. Um, at Fair Play, we have always said that the issue is not bad kids or bad parenting. It's a bad business model and bad design and bad choices made by these companies. Um, and we've been saying that for a long time. And that those, um, when Francis disclosed those documents and showed that Facebook not only knew that they were harming children, but that they didn't do anything about it, it shifted the conversation to the focus away from parents and towards the people that could make a real difference, and that's the companies themselves. So that was huge, that's number one. Number two, um, in early 2021, Facebook, uh, it was revealed that Facebook was planning a kid's version of Instagram. Facebook's stated rationale for it was that there are millions of kids under the age of 13 who are on Instagram anyway because they lie about their age. And so why not provide a safer experience rather than the full-on adult version of Instagram? We didn't believe that for a second for a couple of reasons. First of all, if Facebook wanted to do something about the millions of kids on Instagram who are under the age of 13, they could remove most of them tomorrow. And we knew that Facebook was losing a lot of market share to TikTok and that they wanted to get to kids even younger than TikTok was getting to them. So that's why they wanted to release Instagram for kids. So we did what we always do. We organize. We sent a letter from over 100 leading experts in child development, including some people in this room, like Sherry Turkle, um, to Facebook saying, don't do this. Then we got a letter from 44 state attorneys general to Facebook saying, don't do this. We got a letter from several senators in Washington to Facebook saying, don't do this. We launched petitions with our partners and got over 200,000 parents saying to Facebook, don't do this. Every time we did a new thing in this campaign, we got major press. Any other company would have given up on this project, but Facebook is stubborn. And we needed one last little push to make this thing stop. That push was Frances Haugen. When she released her documents, which showed not only that Facebook knows that its product is harmful to teens and doesn't do anything, but that it's a deliberate market strategy to go after even younger kids, exactly what we had been saying, it made the difference, and within weeks, Facebook said, you know what, we're going to pause that project, and it's still on pause a year later. It's, it's actually slightly worse than that. They said, hey, like we, we, there's this problem, which is we've noticed teenagers are telling their underage siblings, hey, sometimes you shouldn't post things online. 
You know, you should, be, you should hold back a little bit. There's some things that you should keep for yourself because they can hurt you. We need to coach those teenagers to stop telling the tweens to protect themselves. It's that bad. And that is, you know, I actually think one of the things that's most hopeful is that if you talk to teens about their younger siblings, they don't want their younger siblings to be doing the things online that they are doing. They are so protective. They can't stop themselves because they're hooked, but they don't want to see their younger kids. So that is really powerful. And the last thing I'll say about the impact is there was a series of incredible hearings in Washington that were game changing last year because of Francis, including ones that she testified at. Um, and what we are seeing in Washington is Republicans and Democrats who don't agree on a single thing coming together on this issue. We have legislation that we've helped write and that we're organizing support for in Washington that has made it farther. It's still got a ways to go to get to the finish line, but we have made it farther than any legislation in over 20 years when it comes to protecting children online. And that is because Francis changed the conversation in Washington. So the impact is incredible. It really is incredible, Francis. You know, we are, have been talking about our teams that we have at the Screen Time Action Network now, and they're the ones who are saying, we don't want our younger siblings to be suffering the way we are, to be, you know, sort of tethered to the social media that we're tethered to. And they're coming up with their own solutions, which is very exciting. And so, Francis, you've really supported our advocacy. You've really made it possible for us to continue our advocacy. We're grateful. Um, so can you tell us a little bit exactly how these algorithms can lead users to harmful content, especially young users, and then specifically teenage girls. I know that's an area of interest for you. So one of the things that um, Facebook very, very strongly invests in, in terms of the public narrative around its products is, you know, this isn't, this isn't just us. Like, you know, you picked your friends, you picked your interests, I know you're complaining a lot about what you see online, but let's be honest, we didn't pick your friends, we didn't pick your interests. You know, every time you point a finger, four fingers are pointing back at you. And to the point where the head of communications, you know, Nick Clegg, so he's the head of global po public policy, head of communications, said, he wrote a blog post in March of 2021 that said, it takes two to tango. You know, it takes two to tango, stop, stop blaming us. And the crazy thing was, by the time he had written that blog post, for at least four separate times, four times that I had found, they had reproduced the exact same study that showed it wasn't two people tangoing. That even if you took a brand new account, you followed some pretty centrist interests. Like in the case of Instagram, it could be healthy eating, healthy recipes. Let's be honest, we could all eat a little healthier. If you just took that blank account, no friends, no interests, and clicked on the first five posts each day, you know, came back the next day, did it again, followed any hashtags they suggested, because the algorithms are based on something called engagement. So engagement is a click, it's a comment, it's a reshare. Because they say, hey, something that gets more clicks is a better piece of content, Facebook is known for years, at least back to 2018. There's literally a blog post from Mark in 2018 that says the problem with engagement-based ranking is people are drawn to engage with more extreme content. So if you, if you have a system where every day they consider 40,000 posts for you, 100,000 posts for you, and they have to pick a couple to show you first, if you just have that blank account and you click on the content they give you, they keep pushing you further to the extremes. In a political contest that context, that might be a center left or a center right topic, it'll push you to far left, far, far right. It pulls our politics apart. In the case of kids, healthy eating and healthy recipes, just by clicking, leads you to pro-anorexia, like content that celebrates anorexia and pro-self-harm content within two to three weeks. And you can go home and reproduce this yourself. You can go make a new account, you can go do this. And Senator Blumenthal's office did this. In, my, in, my, test, in my, my Senate testimony, they showed screenshots when they did this exact same experiment. It's not too tangoing. It's the algorithms pushing you towards content that's more extreme. Thank you. You know, another way that you've inspired us 
at the Screen Time Action Network at Fair Play is that we have created a group of parents and families who have experienced these harms firsthand, and they are going forward to advocate now, oh, so it won't happen <laughs> to others. Um, but that's inspiring, thank you, and it's also horrific. Um, Josh, again, dedicated your career to supporting children's rights. What policy and legislative efforts that Fair Play is backing um, are inspired by Francis's work? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think, first of all, I think the first thing to, to note is that we tend to think that what's happening online is just the natural course of history. Technology develops and gets refined and refined, and this is just the march of progress. But this big part of the story when it comes to kids is that this stuff is completely unregulated. We have one law that protects children online, and that law was passed in 1998. There were no smartphones, there was no Facebook, there was no TikTok, there was no YouTube, and that's the law we have today. And that law only covers kids up until their 13th birthday, which, if you think about it, is there any other context when you, a kid turns 13 and we say, you're on your own, you're an adult now? We don't do that with anything else except online. And if we say that 13 is the age that when you can get social media, that really means, as I said before, that you're going to have millions of 10 and 11 and 12 year olds on there. So we need to do a number of things with regulation. We need to update the regulations for the internet that the kids, kids live on today, not the internet that they lived on in 1998. We have um, helped write and are organizing support for two bills, the Kids Online Safety Act, or COSA, and an update to the Children's Online Privacy and Protection Act. Um, both of these bills have bipartisan support. Both of these bills advanced out of the Senate Commerce Committee over the summer, and we're now working to get floor votes on them in the Senate. Um, and taken together, these bills would do a number of things. They would extend privacy rights to teens for the first time and special protections for teens for the first time. They would require companies to put the, make their uh, most protective settings on by default for children and teens. So right now you can, on most of these platforms, get a somewhat safer experience if you can figure out where, how to do that and where those settings are. And you have to think about the fact that kids aren't on one platform, kids are on eight, nine different platforms. So to expect parents to be able to figure all that out and monitor that full time is just not realistic. So this would require safe, safety by default. Um, it would require that companies assess how their algorithms are working and what the impact of their algorithms are on children. They would have to work with outside auditors. And if they were causing things like self-harm, or eating disorders, they are required to mitigate that risk. So what we see is a shift in the business model where instead of the only thing that matters to these companies is how can we maximize engagement? How can we capture more kids' attention? How can we capture more of their data so we can make more money off of them? So they have a legal duty that is enforceable by both the Federal Trade Commission and state attorneys generals to look, do what's best for children. This would be a game changer. It would empower other Francis's within their companies to go to their bosses and say, you know what, if we don't do this, we're going to get in trouble. There is a counterbalance to this engagement model and to trying to addict kids. So this is all legislation that we're fighting for right in this moment, as I said. We have a better shot at legislation than at any point in the last two decades. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in the next couple of months because the tech industry does not want to see this happen at all. And they are marshalling. So it's going to be a real question of what wins out, people who care about children or people who care about exploiting children. And, and to give you a little bit of context on why algorithms really matter for kids, one of the things we hear over and over again from pediatricians, from child psychologists, is that we have these kids who struggle with things like eating disorders, they're even in therapy, they're trying to make the right decisions. And because they have this algorithmic weight behind them, because the algorithms have been pushing them towards these directions, you know, they get targeted with ads for diet lollipops. They get targeted with ads that are, that, that make them even more insecure, or it's just, 
they get flooded in their feeds. We don't have a right right now for children to choose between their pasts and their futures. And that can have tragic results. I can. As a parent and a parent educator, I know it's really great to hear teens are still our children. Of course, they're still our children. And um, accountability for corporations, uh, that it's so close. It's closer than it's ever been, has, isn't it, Josh? And what can people do? Can people help support these? Sure. Folks? If you go to our website, uh, fairplayforkids.org, um, the, the, the top story there will tell you how you can contact your senator and urge them to support these bills. Um, as I said, this is a really critical time. Uh, there is, you know, there's a little bit of time when Congress will be in session before the election, and then we're really looking at the lame duck session in December as when we can get these bills passed. So every phone call from parents, every email from parents, um, we walk you through it on our website, what to say, how to make those calls, makes a huge difference. We've seen it in the last few weeks. We've added several co-sponsors to these bills from both parties, I should mention. Um, and so, and that's because we have had parents, and, and our partners have had parents calling and pressing and saying, you know what, enough is enough. And I think one of the things that's really interesting and one of the reasons why this is one of the few issues where there's bipartisan agreement is because this issue affects everyone. It affects everyone. People, grandparents see it, parents see it, and people in Congress are seeing what's happening to their own children. And maybe they're not doing it for the right reasons to protect everybody's children, but we'll take it if they're only doing it uh, for, their, for their own children. Um, and so this is a really critical moment. And, and I want to add one more piece of context, which is, you know, for some of you in the audience that are parents, maybe you're the parents of a teenager, maybe you're the parents of a younger child, you know, maybe you have really been proactive and maybe your kid has really listened and like they're, they're not engaging with social media or they're just a really great, real grounded kid. When I was 14 years old, I had a friend die of bulimia, right? She had an eating disorder and her heart stopped because she had an electrical eye imbalance. I did not have a body image problem. I had a really good relationship with my parents. I did not have any of those problems. And I didn't realize that I was still hurt by her death until I started talking to moms about eating disorders. And in the process of talking about it, I was like, oh my God, I'm still upset about this 20 years later. Just because your kid is okay doesn't mean your kid's friends aren't okay. And until we make sure that every kid is okay, our kids are not okay. <laughs> what a good point, Francis. What a good point for families. Really important. Um, and discussing legislation like this is so hopeful, but we know it takes time to get regulation. We know it takes time to get legislation passed. So is there anything that social media companies can do immediately to safeguard kids? So this is what frustrates me so much. So, so I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pitch a story for you guys. So let's imagine, right now, how many of you have on the little like go to sleep reminder on like YouTube, or I think Instagram has one? Right, you know, it's like it says, hey, it's you know, 10 o'clock, it's 11 o'clock. Do you wanna to go to bed? So what do we do when that pops up? At least, at least myself, I hit snooze because I like YouTube. Let's imagine a different world. Okay, so you have, you have a 16 year old. They are up at 2 a.m. Maybe they're a teeny bit depressed, not super depressed. You know, they're doom scrolling. They're a little stressed. They're, they're, they're doom scrolling on Instagram. Okay, so let's imagine the next morning they're, they're a little hungover on Instagram. They're sitting in, in math class. Imagine a thing popped up and said, hey, when do you want to, want to go to bed tonight? They say, 11. My mom wants me to go to bed at 10. I want to go to bed at 11. And imagine for two hours before bedtime, Instagram got a little bit slower and a little bit slower and a little bit slower. You didn't even notice it was getting slower. And around your bedtime, you kind of were bored and you just went to bed. We've known for 20 years. When I worked at Google in 2006, it was already religion that if you made the app even a teeny bit slower, people search less. We've known if you make an app a little bit, even a little bit slower, imperceptibly slower, you use it less. This feature, a single feature, would save hundreds if not thousands of children's lives globally every year, maybe more. And it would certainly help many, many kids avoid depression or other issues. The crazy thing about this feature is it is already live if you are a hacker stealing content. This is not a feature that would take rocket science. They could launch it in two weeks if they wanted to launch it. 
The issue is we don't have the system of incentives that it would encourage Facebook to not have that child doom scroll at 2 a.m. We need to be pushing for different incentives and consequences when comp tech companies prioritize their own profits over the health of our children. So slowing down an app, a simple, a simple solution. Just that simple. Uh, could really protect a lot of children. And, and, and other things like you can do today, if, if your kids don't have rate limiters on their phones, I encourage you to sit with your kid and say like, let's just track what your usage is for a couple weeks and let's talk about like, do you actually wanna spend that much time doing what you're doing? I encourage you to treat your kids as agents and not as objects, like help them set the boundary, but then say, hey, here's the deal. This app is designed to be addictive. Let's work together on a plan of what you want to do with your social media. And I can hold the password for you. If you want to change your limit, if you want to go up, let's talk about it. But like, let's actually put something where you're in control instead of having a company that clearly doesn't care about your well-being being in control. Absolutely. We find the best discussions happen when kids trust their parents to have the discussion with them. Absolutely. And really, uh, it's not helpful for parents to say, put that thing away, turn that thing off, because their whole life is in there, their friends are in there now, and for us to be able to have, un for them to understand that they're not at fault, the child's not at fault. Kids don't like to be tricked. They really don't like to be I, I really want to emphasize that. Um, one of the things that's very clear in Facebook's own documents is they say that when kids, when people say to kids, why don't you just not use that? It makes them feel ashamed that their suffering is their fault and not a trillion dollar company's fault for, for trying to get the last pennies out of them. We're not saying you shouldn't use social media. We're saying should you hyper optimize for the last hour of engagement? Yeah. And, I, and I also just think um, parents, it is so unfair the choice that parents face right now because totally. the choices are allow your kids to do this and experience all of the harms and, and potential harms that we've been talking about or socially isolate your child. Right. And that is a horrible 100%. and unfair choice that parents should never have to make. But that's, what, th that's the only choice right now. It is. So I have a final question for both of you. This is an enormous problem. It can be overwhelming to try to tackle it. What gives you hope? Francis, you start. So I have a lot of really heavy conversations, like basically all the time, right? You know, I, I talk about things like ethnic violence. I talk about things like political polarization, about um, the death of democracy. It's, it, it can be really intense. And the thing I always try to remind people is every single time we've invented a new communication technology, it's been super disruptive. Like people like to talk about the idea that, that um, the printing press was disruptive. The printing press was not actually disruptive because no one in Europe could read. It was like 3% of Europe could read. Like the, the upper bound was like Italy, it had like more priests, so 9% could read. Like no one could read. It's like great, you have cheaper books, doesn't matter, no one can read. Teaching people to read, that was disruptive, right? Like Martin Luther realizes that the New Testament actually says you're not going to hell. Like please go love people and be kind to each other and try to forgive. And, and he's like, what? <laughs> I've been like torturing myself for 20 years. Everyone has to learn to read. Like they even taught the women to read. That's how much they taught people to read. And, and suddenly misinformation became a problem for the first time. Like people published pamphlets about like, how do you know if your neighbor's a witch? Six questions to ask, right? It was like the, the beginning of Buzzfeed. And, and you know, and then we got the cheap printing press, which is like newspapers. Right, and we had little wars. We had wars fought over misinformation, yellow journalism, but we responded. You know, we got journalism schools and we got journalistic ethics and laws about media concentration and media transparency and we figured out how to live with newspapers. And then we got radio and people had a personal relationship with their leaders in a way that they never had before. And we had the rise of dictators in places like Europe in World War II. You know, we've, we've had these things happen before, and we respond. We invest in public media. We invest in uh, different ways of connecting with the public. We, in, we figure out how to respond. We figure out how to live with these technologies. And the reality is 
there's a lot of paths forward. There's ways of designing for autonomy and dignity. Guess what? Capitalism does not necessarily instinctively optimize for autonomy and dignity. But we respond and we say, no, 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 no. Technology lives in democracy's house. And we can get there. And we are living in that moment right now. In 1965, we had cars that killed us at three and a half times the rate they do today, right? And to give you a sense, even today, more people have died of automotive accidents in the last 20 years than in all of the major wars Americans fought in in the 20th century. It's crazy. But imagine three and a half times as many people. What changed was a single book came out called, called Unsafe at Any Speed. And the next year, we got the Department of Transportation, and the year after that, we got seatbelts in all cars, not some cars. We had known about seatbelts. We'd had seatbelts in cars for 25 years, but it took a single book to start the sea change. The work that Josh is doing, the work that everyone in the ecosystem of accountability is doing, is how we are going to get social media we can live with for the future. And it might get worse in the short term, but I have 100% faith we can get to a better world. I'm going to hang on those words every day when I go to work. So I like to stand up when I talk about hope. Um, no, I think, um, I think it's really important, this question, because I talk to families every day. Jean and Francis talk to families every day. And if you ask them, almost no one is happy if they have a child from age 6 to 25 with their family's relationship with media. They just don't think that things can change. And so it's really important to understand that the way things are are because of deliberate choices made by these companies that are unregulated. And through regulation and changing the incentive structure, things can change. And I think because, um, because we're here in this incredible art exhibit by John, I've been thinking a lot about climate change and that movement and the parallels to what we're up against with technology and kids. And, you know, the first stage is agreeing that there's a problem and overcoming industry denying that there's a problem and funding scientists to say that there's not a problem. And we've seen the same thing with tech and mental health and kids with, you know, denying that there was a problem. But we're beyond that now. We're, we're past that stage. There is a consensus, a scientific consensus, a parent consensus, a pediatrician consensus, a psychologist consensus, that something is really wrong and we must do something about it. The next thing that you need are solutions. And we have solutions. Maybe doesn't, everybody isn't quite on the same page about what those solutions are, but there's general agreement. There's general agreement about changing design, about protecting privacy and cutting off the data flows, about going after the business model. Um, so that's important. We are, we are at the point where we're talking about solutions. And then the next stage is we need enough people power to overcome the strength of industry. And we're starting to see that. We're starting to see parents organize. We're starting to see parents call out these tech companies. We're starting to see parents be leaders in demanding that their representatives in Washington do something about this issue. So that's what gives me hope. Um, and the other thing that gives me hope is, you know, I think as a natural tendency for somebody who's been doing this work for a while to see the tech companies and the people who work there as monsters. Francis is clearly not a monster. And there are many, many people in these companies that I have come to understand want to do the right thing. And so we need to change things to support those people, to give them a bigger voice so they can make the changes that we need. Um, so the real reason I stood is because Fair Play is honored to have the permission of the Fred Rogers estate to give out the Fred Rogers Integrity Award, named in honor of the beloved host of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. In the 1960s, Fred Rogers saw media as a revolutionary new way to nurture children and meet developmental needs they might not be getting met otherwise. Unfortunately, far too much media today does the opposite. Instead of respecting children's developmental vulnerabilities, Big tech exploits them, making kids feel that they have to be online all the time, no matter what the costs. 
We give the Fred Rogers Integrity Award to those who go to great lengths and often great risks to do all they can to ensure that the media environments that play such a role in shaping who our kids are, their behaviors, their values, who their friendships are, and what those friendships look like, that those in, in, uh, environments put kids' interests first. And as we have been discussing all night, that is exactly what Francis Haugen did. But don't take my word for it. We have some friends who couldn't be here tonight who also wanted to say a few words. But I'm here today because I believe Facebook's products harm children, stoke division, and weaken our democracy. The company's leadership knows how to make Facebook and Instagram safer, but won't make the necessary changes because they have put their astronomical profits before people. And what's super tragic is Facebook's own research says, as these young women begin to consume this eating disorder content, they get more and more depressed, and it actually makes them use the app more. And so they end up in this feedback cycle where they hate their bodies more and more. Facebook's own research says, it is not just that Instagram is dangerous for teenagers, that it harms teenagers, it's that it is distinctly worse than other forms of social media. Dear Francis, thank you for being a leading influence in demanding accountability from big tech companies and demanding transparency. Holding big tech companies accountable helps kids like me be safe. And as somebody who has had social media prey on my vulnerabilities and had social media infringe on my data, on my attention, on my mental health and my time, I am so, so grateful for you. Hi, I'm Richard Blumenthal, United States Senator from Connecticut. Very proud and excited to be congratulating Francis Haugen on the Fred Rogers Integrity Award from Fair Play. Well deserved. I invited Frances Haugen to testify before our subcommittee on consumer protection and her words were riveting, powerful and impactful in the Senate and in the country. She spoke truth to power in highlighting the damage done to kids by destructive content often driven to them by big tech and the need to hold big tech accountable and provide safeguards and reform which we are now spearheading. Thank you, Frances Haugen, and thank you, Fair Play. Well, Frances is basically an American hero. She's worked with us at Common Sense and the folks at Fair Play to do extraordinary work for kids and families here in the United States and around the world. She just blew the doors off of Facebook's obfuscations and helped the whole world see why so many problems occur on these platforms. So bless you and thank you, Frances, and Fair Play, thank you so much for honoring such a great person. We have great work to do in the years ahead. Thanks a lot. Congratulations, Francis, on this well-deserved recognition. You have demonstrated the personal, rare personal courage to put the interests of others and your country ahead of your own personal career. Congratulations. Facebook's own research about Instagram contains quotes from kids saying, I feel bad when I use Instagram, but I also feel like I can't stop. And I, I feel a lot of pain for those kids, right? Like they, they, they say they fear being ostracized if they step away from the platform. So imagine you're in this situation, you're in this relationship where every time you open the app, it makes you feel worse, but you also fear isolation if you don't. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity here to make social media that makes kids feel good, not feel bad and that we have an obligation to our youth to make sure that they're safe online. Francis, it is my pleasure to present you with the Fred Rogers Integrity Award. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, this is this is such a treat. Um, we have we have such an amazing opportunity ahead of us. I think one of the things that um, you know I'm really committed to. Um, so I'm I'm founding a new nonprofit called Beyond the Screen, 
And part of our intention with it is that right now there are a very limited number of people in the world. Like they're on the, on, on the order of like maybe 300 and 400 people in the entire world who really understand how these algorithms work and their intersections with the product features and the product choices that go into these experiences. And the reality is the number of people in the world right now who are really good at understanding the algorithms and also are broadly read enough who really understand the people People who like math and people who like people, they often are different groups of people. <laughs> Just to, you know, saying it completely honest. Um, we have such an amazing opportunity to say, hey, we care so much about journalism because we understand how essential it is to democracy that we have junior high newspapers. I don't know if you've ever read a junior high newspaper. They're not great newspapers. You know, we don't do them because they make great journalism. We do them because it's important to have a huge funnel of people who connect with the process of journalism so that we have the people who defend democracy. I think we are at just at the forefront of realizing we need to open up the doors. We need to start funneling more and more people into thinking about how do we design these, these virtual experiences, you know, these experiences made out of math because they craft our information environments. They craft the experiences that our children spend hours with a day. And I think we are going to discover in the process of bringing more people to the table that we can have social media, we can have social platforms that let us have the democracies, that have the societies, that have spaces for our, our kids that, where we feel safe and feel good, that it's possible. We just need to have more people at the table. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for this. It's, this is a total treat. I was a big Mr. Rogers fan as a child. And I, and I really appreciate how much he values children as human beings, like as people. And so this is, this is really meaningful for me. Thank you so much. Um, the social and the governance part is so important because we are funding these companies and at the end of the day, these companies are becoming monstrous and the way the, they are using data, and I think Facebook uses psychometry analysis, and not only Facebook, other similar companies. And I feel like the more you use social media, that it gives you anxiety, it's like the adrenaline rush, and when you're not using your like sober, it's like a different kind of a drug. So I always tell like, I don't do drugs because I'm on social media, it's a different drug. <laughs> So I would love to understand, as an investor, when we are looking at these companies, what are the social governance responsible um, questions or things that we should be asking? I'm a former techie, but I don't want this uh, uh, no, session totally. to be very technology I, focused. Yeah. But um, it's more, and I'm also a mother. I'm, I'm very. I have a three-year-old who is also like Coco Melon and everything going on. Um, you know, so, I just learned about Coco Melon too. So yeah, I, would I don't have a kid, but I know what Coco Melon is. Yeah, so I would love to understand from that point of view because we are the ones who are funding this, and then they are going big, and this is what is happening. Yeah, so we are we are basically creating the future of what's happening. So I actually want to broaden it slightly more. Was it's not just about ESG, right? It's not just about being a responsible investor. Um, so one of the one of the focus areas for our, our nonprofit is actually around capacity building around investors and litigators. Because we need, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly rare as someone who has a focus on algorithms because I have an MBA. So I went, I went to Harvard, got an MBA. And I understand the idea that we are not kept safe in isolation by our government, just by our government. You know, it's not just we need a magical law and that's the magical thing that's going to make us safe. It's an ecosystem. Right? It's investors that prioritize long-term returns over short-term returns. Because let's be honest, if you make a kid miserable from age you know, 13 to 25, you know, you're going to have fewer long-term customers. Right? Having happier users generally means more long-term profits. But, it, so, but the secondary thing is, um, social media, the number one thing for investors is rule of law. Right? Rule of law is the number one thing you need to have successful long-term investments. And right now, particularly outside the United States, social media is compromising social stability. We've seen a genocide in Myanmar, we've seen one in Ethiopia, where international observers, you know, the UN wrote a multi-hundred page report detailing why Facebook led to the genocide in Myanmar. Investors should be caring about the questions around how do we manage social media companies. 
And we're doing a project called Duty of Care. I'm happy to, if you write to us, my email's on my website. We can send you our white paper. We want to talk about how do we begin describing the difference between Be Real, which is the fastest growing um, social media company right now, um, and Facebook. How do we talk about TikTok versus Instagram? How do we talk about Twitter versus any of these things? What are the important dimensions and how can we coach these companies towards long-term success? So there's a lot of opportunities. There's real meaningful differences. And there's an important job for investors, be they ESG or traditional investors, in putting pressure on these companies towards being positive civic actors. Other questions? Ryan. So one of the things I saw after the Wall Street Journal leak was that Facebook has a lot of great research. And also in the research, there's a lot of great solutions. And I believe there was one document, the Teen Mental Health Deep Dive, and it showed that um, teens had some solutions to how to make Facebook or Instagram better for their experience. And one of those was about having better control over um, their timeline and like the content. But then I'm just wondering, like, with Reels now and TikTok competing, how does that like influence the decisions that Facebook's making? Because TikTok, you know, you don't have influence over the, your your feed. So, how does that just influence Facebook's decisions and not listening to their own research? Uh, I I care a lot about corporate governance. So the reason I, I I was at Google before I got my MBA. I was there for three years. I worked on search quality. I could just stay there indefinitely. Um, the reason I got an MBA was I really understood the costs of organizational health. If any of you have watched the TV show Silicon Valley, uh, I have trouble with this TV show. I made it halfway through the first season because it's not a comedy, <laughs> it's a documentary. <laughs> um, and there's a bunch of things they play for laughs that if you actually knew someone who had lived through that experience, like resting and investing is actually not leisurely, right? Like I had a friend who got literally, like everyone else got to sit in a room with either three to six coworkers he was the only one I knew who didn't sit alone. He sat alone in a room down the hallway. Right, it was a subtle hint to get, get the heck out. You know, go find a new job. Um, and he sat there for six months. And the only person he got to talk to was me because I was his product manager and he was the last engineer I had left on that project. Right? Um, corporate governance really matters. And right now inside of Facebook, um, even at Enron, I learned this last week, at Enron, they had on their, on their stationery a quote from Martin Luther King. It said, the day that we stop speaking the truth about things that matter, our lives begin to end. At Facebook, there is not even that level of space about saying the truth. And as a result, no one inside of Instagram is saying, hey, the only reason why people continue to use our app is because of the social graph. People feel locked in even though they don't like us, even though there's all this toxic press about how we're being horrible to them. They keep using Facebook, they keep using Instagram because their friends are there. Right now, Instagram is facing a really hard problem, which is on TikTok, you can't multitask. Before, you could watch Netflix and you could second screen on Instagram. And so Instagram got a whole bunch of minutes as kids multitasked. And kids have moved from Netflix to, to TikTok, where the only way you get the next video is if you actively swipe to the next video. There is no picture in picture on TikTok. And Instagram is looking at their metrics and saying, oh no, the number of minutes we get with kids every day is going down. And instead of being willing to accept that they're gonna get 20% less minutes a day, or 30% less minutes a day, but be a business five years from now, they are sacrificing the social graph to try to copy TikTok. That clearly means that right now inside the company, no one feels like they can say what I just said. No one can say, hey, we might have to accept we're going to be 30% less profitable, but be here in five years. Instead, they're trying to become TikTok, and they're going to fail at being TikTok because they're, they're second-rate TikTok. How do you balance um, <clears throat> global competitiveness? This is the week of the United Nations <clears throat> General Assembly. <clears throat> seen folks from Africa and emerging markets, and some of them have been extremely progressive in terms of technology and they've leapfrogged and payment systems and, and, other, and other areas. So how do you balance the, um, the technology towards, towards this for competitiveness? Because at the end of the day, you want um, you know, America to, to still have, I think was it John who mentioned something about 
Facebook in the U.S. is sort of cleaner versus overseas, but at the same time, the defense mechanisms are even better overseas. So I, I welcome your thoughts there. Um, so when we design for safety, so I'll give you an example. Should you have to click on a link before you reshare it? It sounds really simple. It's like, hey, maybe you should know what you're spreading around. Like, maybe we should actually have to look at that page before you share it. Sounds really simple. Click on a link before you reshare it. You get 10 or 15% less misinformation, and yet Twitter was, was willing to do it and Facebook wasn't. It's like, why, why is that? That's a really interesting question. I know it may not seem like it, but Twitter's audience, their users, are actually much more literate than Facebook's are. Right? Internationally, Facebook did a, a very clever thing competitively. They went into other countries and said, if you use our products, your data is free. If you use anything on the open web, you're going to pay for it yourself. And as a result, because market incentives are real, Facebook became the internet for a billion or a billion and a half people. You know, they went, those societies, they completely converged onto Facebook because 30 or 40% of the people on the internet in those countries only could afford to use Facebook. If we want to have competitors come after these big tech companies, we need to be lobbying against something called zero rating. That's that process of saying, my products are free, but everyone else costs money. Because if you'll notice, the only place where the Facebook killer came from was China, where Facebook was prohibited from playing. You know, competition causes solutions, but if we allow big tech companies to prevent competition, we're not going to see other ways of existing online. Hi, thank you. Um, you mentioned that this is basically the only bipartisan issue today that's agreed upon. Who are the biggest people in the Congress or Senate against your work? Who is sort of for big tech and say, you know, the kids are, they're on their own? Um, that's a great question. Um, nobody has been that explicit. Um, I think, um, <laughs> you know, uh, Senator Maria Cantwell has been a huge problem. Um, Good to know. <laughs> really not wanting to move things forward. And it was a huge fight to even get these bills to the it, Senate Commerce. Do you have an inclination as to why her, if it's a, it's a funding thing, where we're just... Well, she's I've, in Washington, which is Amazon, Microsoft, um, so that could be one reason, but I don't have a... Um, Lots of people have tried to figure out, like, for instance, the, you know, we, we're closer to a comprehensive national privacy law uh, in this country than we, we ever have been before. And Maria Cantwell right now is the biggest one holding that up. Um, she has not moved that forward. She's the, uh, in, in the Senate. So that's a, that's a huge issue. Um, so I think, um, but I don't, you know, I think nobody has come out um well very few people actually senator um braun in indiana told us yesterday that he would not support one of our bills but most of them have not said we're not supporting most of them, oh we're still looking at it we're you know trying read the tea leaves of whether this is going to make them look really bad not to support this legislation if they can get away with not supporting this legislation that's what their inclination is to do um but we're not at the point yet where a lot of them have told us actively no um, so that's, uh, that's a really interesting moment. But um, Campbell's a problem. <laughs> Thanks for the mic. Uh, so that ends question and answer, and I'm going to stand up here right now and say, we need help. Whether it's financially, or connections, or the spreading of awareness, if I told you how much money I put into this exhibition, you all would give. <laughs> it's been a lot. It takes a lot. We're trying to move mountains. And we're working for the community. And I ask you to please help us in any way that you can. We have uh, donation cards. Where's Ellie Manko? We have donation cards there with Ellie Manko. Are you passing those out right now? So <laughs> let's get those out there. Um, if anyone would like to come up here and speak to Josh afterwards and in other ways that you might be able to help, I um, encourage that. This has been a tremendous effort, this exhibition, this month, all the effort that these leaders put into what they believe in for us. So please uh, help us out. So while these are getting spread around, I do want to say one thing. I have a 15-year-old daughter. And uh, by far, the most difficult thing for me, parenting, 
is this smartphone, hands down, hands down. And I've started something, she's 15, so she can understand things now on a, on a, on a, on a good level, intellectual level. The other day, uh, I watched a YouTube video of uh, Jonathan Haidt, who will actually be here uh, next, uh, next week. And he was speaking about uh, adolescent girls, my daughter's age, growing up on social media, spoke about depression and anxiety. And uh, I decided I'm gonna watch this with my daughter. So we loaded up YouTube and we watched this and I said, her name is Lucia, and I said, I just wanna watch this with you because I'm just wondering, you know, he has all these scientific facts and I just wonder how much of it pertains to you because you're in this age group. And we'd go through each point and she said, that one, like 80%, that one, yeah, maybe, I have to think about it more. But here's what happened, and I've done this on, with, with, with many different uh, thought leaders in this space right, that I share with her. It shows her that there is a community out there that is super smart and they're working for the good of children and the community. And it takes me out of the position of being the bad guy, right? Because she sees there are other people that are thinking my way and they're smarter than her father, like by far, right? So I encourage you, it's really hard as parents, we're not being helped. That's, I mean, this is all designed to get around the parents. You know, we used to talk at Fair Play how back in the day it was the Avon door-to-door -door salesman who would knock on your door and the parents would decide do you come in or not. Now that salesman is in our pockets, right? And this is by design and they know they're doing this. So we are being bypassed as parents to get into the minds of our children. And it's complicated. So I just invite you all to share with your kids, those who do have kids, that there's a community out there that are saying great things, that are looking out for their best interests. And the best thing about it is that we become the good guys as parents. So I encourage you to do that. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. This was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful special event and it has meant a lot to me. We had uh, Tristan Harris here last night, and I said to Tristan, I said, you know, Tristan, when I decided I wanted this to be a forum, there were two people I wanted here. It was you, Tristan Harris, and you, Francis Haugen. So thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it.